in this lecture, um, we are continuing the uh, discussion of the magnetic dipole radiation. Um, so this is actually the third um, lecture in this derivation. And where we left off last time is we had derived now the um, vector potential, A, uh, uh, which form is right here. Uh, so it's actually kind of a, a long and complicated looking equation. Um, but what we can do is we can look at something like the static limit. Where it's not oscillating, it's just a, um, a, a loop of current. <clears throat> and when you do that, and you plug in omega is equal to zero, then what you get is a cosine which becomes one, a sine which becomes zero, and it reduces to a form which we saw in the magnetostatics chapter um, for the vector potential from a loop of current. So the good news is that even though we start we we derived which looks like a complicated expression, it's actually a much general form that reduces to the special case of uh, magnetostatics. Okay, so now what I want to do is I want to start with the more general form and apply an approximation. So now this time, this will be our third approximation in this derivation. And that approximation is that the point at which we're measuring the radiation is much, much bigger than C over omega, or it's much, much bigger essentially than the wavelength um, of the radiation. Okay, so when we do that, that means that um, as R gets big, then one over R goes to zero. And then we can reduce the form down to minus mu zero di magnetic dipole moment times omega over four pi speed of light sine theta over r sine omega times the time and then all of that is in the phi direction so I'm going to try and squeeze the phi in there. Okay, put the phi direction in there. Okay, so um, so we only keep the sine um, term. And now with that, let's solve for the electric field. And what we started in the first der first video of this derivation, we said there is no electric potential, V is zero. So all we need to do is take the time derivative of the magnetic potential. Okay, so when we do that, what we get is for the electric field, so we get these constants out front, omega squared, because we have to take the derivative of the sine, so that brings out an omega. Sine theta over r doesn't change. This now becomes a cosine, omega t minus rc. And then I'm going to stick the phi depend the phi direction right here on the end. <clears throat> okay, so that's our electric field. Our magnetic field we can find by taking the curl of the vector potential. And when we do that, um, the vector potential is only in the phi direction. So the only com uh, components that we get are the derivative with theta, sine theta times the phi component, and that's in the r direction, plus 1 over r, the um, r derivative,
the phi component, and that's in the theta direction. So the, <clears throat> since there's only a phi component to the potential, these are the only two terms that um, we have to worry about. Okay, so let's take a look at the first term, the derivative with theta. So when we take that derivative with respect to theta, we get one over r sine theta, something which is gonna be very long. Okay, so I close both brackets. <clears throat> um, and so, uh, oh, but now the sine theta can cancel. So what we're left with is minus mu naught m zero omega four pi c r squared uh, cosine theta over r squared sine omega times the time. Like that. Okay, so that's the first term. Now let's take a look at um, uh, the, um, oh, now we'll take a look at the second term. And what we get is this is the derivative with r. So um, I can just write it out again. So I'm going to make sure I close all my brackets. Um, Close the head bracket, one right there, another one right here. Um, and last but not least, there is a square bracket. I should start color coding my brackets. Okay, but anyway, so we have to take the derivative of all of that stuff. Okay, so when we do that, what we get is mu zero, m zero, omega, over four pi c sine of theta over r um, because the r is canceled right here we don't have to worry about that so the one over r comes from the term out front um, and then we take the derivative of the trig function So that's the only place where there is an r in the function. And then I also have to multiply by minus omega c to take the chain rule. OK, so let's clean this up a little bit. So instead, we get now minus mu naught m0 omega squared over 4 pi c squared the sine of theta over r, the cosine of omega times the time. Okay, so that's a much, um, that's a little bit cleaner um, form. So now if we put all the terms together, um, uh, what we find is that that first term, um, which is right here, This first term that we got from the um, derivative um, with theta, that has a one over r squared in it. And I'm gonna invoke the third approximation, which says that one over r goes towards zero um, at large r. And so if you compare them, this term has a one over r squared, this term only has a one over r. So I'm actually going to ignore the first term, I'm gonna let it drop out, and my magnetic field then becomes 
just the second term. And that term was in the theta direction. Okay, so um, okay, so what do we have? So if we compare this equation right here to what we got for the electric field up here, um, what you find is that they are um, essentially the same without a, by a factor of one over the speed of light. Um, so what we have is that the fields are in phase with each other. They both go as the same cosine omega t. Um, so there is no phase angle between them. So E and B are in phase. The magnitudes of them differ only by a factor of the speed of light. Um, and um, Oh, and then they're also, um, so the electric field is in the phi direction. The magnetic field is in the theta direction. So they are perpendicular to each other. So we're talking about a transverse wave again. And last but not least, what I could do is take a look at the pointing vector. And the pointing vector is 1 over mu naught, the electric field crossed in the magnetic field, <clears throat> which means I get mu 0 over C, all this stuff squared, squared because the magnetic and electric field are essentially the same without a factor of um, C. And it's in the, I'm calling it the n hat direction. So n hat is perpendicular to E, which is perpendicular to B. So we have a doubly transverse electromagnetic wave. Okay. So if I now look at the average pointing vector, right? Then, so if I integrate over time, so I integrate over the cosine squared, that gives me a factor of one half. And so in the end, what I have is mu zero, m zero squared, omega to the fourth, over 32 pi squared, c cubed, sine squared theta over r squared in the r direction. So that, I mean, I called it n hat, but at this point we can just call it r. So what we have is now the um, total power. We can integrate the pointing vector over a surface area that the um, radiation is um, being, is going through. So if we integrate now over the surface area, what we get is mu zero, m0 squared omega to the fourth 12 pi c cubed so the power now goes as omega to the fourth and if we compare that to the electric vector so the power for the magnetic dipole versus the power for the electric dipole we get mu0 m0 squared omega to the fourth over 12 pi c cubed over mu zero p zero, the dipole moment, the electric dipole moment. And what we get is m zero squared over p zero squared c squared. <clears throat> and so that is the ratio of the magnetic dipole moment to the electric dipole moment.